Welcome, everybody. I will go ahead and start the pre-meeting. And let's see here, we will have Councilman Hensley will lead us in prayer. And we have some miscellaneous agenda items this evening, including a pandemic update, which will be um, a written update from Christy. We will recognize our finance department for some awards this evening. And uh, Councilman Hussey, item C, he's actually going to be at the next meeting. So we can we'll move that to uh, the following meeting. And we do have a public hearing, uh, Mr. Marash. Yeah, thank you. And that also includes the bill to uh, adopt a, a new rate table for the wastewater uh, rates in, in, in the wastewater fund. Uh, basically, I, my thought was I'd give the presentation I've, I've given several times now. Uh, since we're having the public hearing tonight, and that way people have the opportunity if they just tuned in now to see that presentation. And then, uh, so that's, that's kind of what I had in mind of doing. That's pleases the council. Okay, any questions? All right, and item six, appointments by the mayor. Mrs. Strope. Thank you. This is for a, an ad hoc committee, um, just a group of individuals who will be put together to look at the historic preservation code. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. And um, under announcements, I might call on uh, one of you to mention the ribbon cutting tomorrow. Would that be you, Mr. Marash? Sure. Okay. I'll call on you for that. And then. Item 10, or let's see, we have a few people already signed up, I believe, and we'll continue to take, okay, we'll continue to take names on that. Any questions on consent? Uh, Councilman uh, Kemna? Okay. Perfect. I will call on you. Sure. I'll call on you then under, uh, under announcement. So, perfect. Thank you. And we have several bills introduced, so we'll run through some of them fairly quickly. But the first one here has a check mark, number 13, Chief Schofield. Yes, thank you, Mayor. The council may recall that we uh, had funding approved uh, previously, April 19th, that was Ordinance 16123, uh, for the replacement of the roof at fire station number three. Uh, this is a contract uh, actually make that happen. So. I know there was some discussion about uh, different options. We did put this out to bid on two different occasions. Uh, first time we only received two bids back and there was some, some confusion over the alternates that we wanted to, to specify in there. We, from the very beginning, wanted to get a, a really good bead on whether we would replace this with an asphalt roof or potentially a metal roof. So we, we got prices back for both. And this contract represents uh, the low bid It was, um, for an asphalt roof, there, there are other options within that, that bid packet. They are significantly more expensive. So happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Okay, and uh, item 14, Mr. Marash. Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a seal coat project, part of our asphalt overlay uh, menu of projects we're doing, but it's a little over $97,000. And uh, we're doing a, a cooperative procurement on this. So Moberly had bid this project uh, similarly, got a good bid. So uh, we'll piggyback on their contract to do this, this work. Thank you, any questions? Item 15 is just a withdrawn bill that had already been placed on there before it was able to be taken off the agenda. So we'll disregard that. Number 16, Mr. Marash. Thank you. Um, so this would uh, this is a study for our transit facilities. Uh, it's called transit feasibility, but it's really when it boils down to it, it's our transit facilities. So that's our office space, central maintenance, things like that. Uh, so uh, we were able to secure a grant through Campo uh, to pay for the majority of this study. So forty thousand of the fifty would come from uh, through those funds, the planning grant. I think I'm calling that right. Sonny can correct me if not. But anyway. Uh, and so we'd hire uh, a contract with Cook, Flat, and Strobel. Uh, they have a local office here, engineering office here, and they have some architects they work with to do these type studies uh, for city facilities. Uh, once that were completed, uh, then, you know, it would kind of give us a cost estimate and a footprint, those kind of things of a, a new transit facility. We'd, then we'd be able to in a position to apply for grants 
uh, to try to get those those kind of things uh, actually constructed. So we've done a couple of these in the past, so we're kind of honing in on on a looking at Hyde Park, if anything can be done there, as well as our current facility where our transfer station would remain. But um, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Councilwoman Wiseman? Yeah, didn't we just do a transit, um, didn't we just do a transit um, audit? Well, we've done a couple of things. So, you know, the last study we did in transit was uh, more about uh, ridership and, um, uh, routes, things of that nature. So it wasn't facility orientated. Uh, but now we also had, unless you're talking about the Triennial Review, which was a review of our whole operations by the feds, they do it every three years. And so actually I had a meeting with them this morning about that. So I'm not sure which one you're asking about. I, I was asking more about the, the first one, the feasibility study that we did, and it didn't include anything about buildings and it didn't include, because I know we talked about routes and we talked about moving routes and and I mean, we did some moving of routes, but. Yeah, that that uh, that one didn't focus on the facilities. Now, in the past, there was one done on facilities. Uh, it it was looking at moving the transfer points to even up here by City Hall, um, all over the place. This was before I was really involved with transit, but that was several years old. One of the issues with that is, is that um, you know, obviously we don't control those properties. Those, uh, those studies looked at moving the facility away from where our ridership is, uh, maybe to a new location. If you move that out off Hyde Park somewhere, then for that facility, you know, how do our users get there? You know, there, a lot of them walk to the facility now. So we want to keep it, try to keep it in the same place. So what do we have to do to our building to make it compliant? That kind of thing. Uh, it's quite old from the early 1980s, I like think 1982. You can imagine the bathrooms are out of date and the size, just the sizes, ADA, all that stuff. Uh, and then the central maintenance facility was constructed with that building in the past. Obviously, we keep updating that as we go, but it would be nice to maybe look at a location for that separate of the, the bus facility. So that's, again, looking at city already city-owned properties, uh, if those could fit in those locations. Thank you. Number 17, Mr. Marash. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so everybody knows where uh, we've been talking about city county uh, funding with the sales tax. And so we're coming to the end of the current sales tax. And that's what these two next things are about. But having agreements with the county, the county's already signed off on these. But basically, uh, and we've talked about them at other meetings here at the city, whether it's public works and planning. And I think maybe you might even talk to at a council meeting already. But uh, so what came of that was two projects to kind of uh, look at what we would do with the funds uh, uh, as a result of, you know, changing changing gears with the Clark and Dunklin project. But basically, uh, Grant Street is this first agreement. So this is an agreement for Grant Street, a city county project. And they would uh, uh, propose to use uh, $550,000 of the city county county funds for this project. And so it's a Grant Street sidewalk. Sorry about that. And then it also has some amenities right at the entrance of the park. So this is where the new amphitheater is and those kind of things. And so there's some islands being built and some ways to maneuver people through there. And, uh, and we're anticipating that the, the parks department would cover that, the additional funds there, about $100,000 for, for a total of a $650,000 project. So what this does is uh, we presented this to the county. They liked the plan. Uh, we've talked about it at Public Works and Planning Committee meeting. So this would basically get them to send us the money within 30 days of signing this agreement so we could proceed. Thank you. Uh, number 18, Matt. <clears throat> so the second piece of that is uh, when we come to the end of these sales tax, we always look at the dollar amount each party's contributed uh, towards the projects uh, and the, the overall commitments, 11 million uh, from each or total, 5.5 million from each entity. And so we, after we've ticked off all our projects, including the Grand Street one I've just talked about, and doing some still, there's still some minor adjustments to come over at Clark and Dunklin. Uh, we have that contracted. I don't believe they've started it yet. We've got some lighting. I think the lighting's been done though. Uh, but um, the, uh, so this would be the remainder of that money would be uh, 
uh, uh, contemplated a move to the MSP project. That's where we have our uh, grant through the Economic Development Administration, EDA. Uh, and so anyway, the, the project would be, you know, to construct the infrastructure related to uh, the conference center and hotel, et cetera, at the MSP. So by doing this, it actually does a good thing. So we'd end up with about a four and a half million dollar project and, and to break it down, the county would be, they'd get their a uh, little over 1.5 million of their remaining funds. That's That would total them out to the 11 million. Uh, then we'd already pledged 1.4 of the city funds. And then the EDA grant on top of that, one, another 1.5 million. So that those monies we estimate should uh, go ahead and do all the infrastructure that was committed to when we obtained the state state's property. And so uh, prior to moving this money over here, though, you know, you know, we had that road that went up the hill that wasn't in our grant proposal at the time. We just ran out of funding, uh, but this this has allowed us to go ahead and fulfill that commitment to get that once we got that we said we got would do once we got the property and not have future projects like this we anticipate in the next sales tax. So if you looked at the uh, next sales tax brochure, you wouldn't see MSP like you have for the last umpteen years. Uh, this we anticipate would do, do uh, all our commitments there. All right, thank you. We've got about three minutes, so we'll run through these really quick on number 19. Um, Sonny, you'll take that one. Would it be you? Um, Mr. Dave Helmick's gonna do 19 and 20 on abatement and demolition uh, supplemental appropriations. Okay, and then on 21, would that be Ryan? Yeah, um, on 21, um, I'll explain a little bit further, but it looks like that one is actually going to be withdrawn. So, uh, okay. or request to be withdrawn by staff. All right. I'll uh, 22. Just call it, on you. Yeah, 22 is a um, is a vacation of the right of way. Actually, the alleys that are behind here in the police station. Okay, and number 20. Three. 23 is approving some code language and a form license agreement for um, for small vehicle shared active transportation operations. Not my term, uh, but uh, scooter businesses. Okay, and on the informal, we have uh, number three um, and Councilman Fitzwater. Okay. Um, and then on the resolutions, there's three resolutions. Mr. Sanders. Uh, yes, 2021-4 uh, is uh, an application for a historic preservation grant. We actually had to apply for it already. The deadline was June 1st. Uh, Rachel Sinzi will be presenting that to the council. Okay. And then um, number five, Ryan. Yeah, this resolution authorizes the execution of an assignment and assumption agreement uh, that relates to the city's Chapter 100 uh, bond pro uh, project at the Continental Commercial Projects or Products uh, Project. Essentially, this is an agreement that allows for transfer of the bonds from one company to another. Essentially, uh, uh, the, the the project, the business is being sold, but because the uh, the, uh, the real estate and the personal property is actually held in title by the city. Uh, this uh, this uh, agreement uh, has to be executed by the city. Um, we have some commitments that uh, the city would not unreasonably withhold its consent, um, and uh, neither staff nor bond council has, has found any reason why that consent should be withheld. So this is as a uh, uh, approval recommendation. Okay, and number six, Sunny. Uh, yes, Katrina Williams heard it. Uh, uh, city staff in participating with this planning activity so she'll be presenting the uh, resolution to the council and there is a member of the regional planning commission which put the plan together that can answer questions if uh, she cannot answer those I'd like to answer any questions okay and any questions before we adjourn all right and quick housekeeping issue we will inter have an introduction of tegan after item three um, so just a heads up we'll let you tell a little about about yourselves mr cole will introduce you so thank you all right, with that, I will call this meeting adjourned and we will get ready to start our meeting. Just wait for the signal from the back. Are we good to start? Okay, and you're hearing us okay on our microphones. Anyone need to get closer? Are we good? Okay. All right, so welcome everyone. So before we begin our meeting, we will have a prayer by Councilman Hussey, followed by the, I'm sorry, Hensley. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So sorry, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Lord, teach us to be generous. Teach us to serve our neighbors as they require. 
to give of ourselves and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for a reward, except to know that we are applying our best judgment and efforts to the betterment of our community. And we pray especially for our neighbors who work to secure and protect our public safety, who put themselves between danger and the rest of us day and night. We are grateful for them and for all that they do to keep us safe. And for all of the unspoken intentions of those assembled here, we say, Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, liberty, and I will now call to order the Monday, June 7th City Council meeting and there is virtual joining information on our website at jeffersoncitymo.gov on the agenda. You can click on the link or you can call in participation and that information is also listed on the agenda. Mrs. Donaldson, roll call please. Fitzwater? Present. Hensley? Present. Kimna? Present. Lester? Here. Schreiber? Present. Spencer? Here. Spicer? Present. Vote? Here. Ward? Here. Wiseman? Present. Item three, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And we have a special introduction Mr. Kroll would like to make at this time. I'd like to introduce Tegan Trammell, with, uh, who is a political science student at Benedictine College. Is that right? So, want to give any other information? <laughs> nope, that's about it. I mean, just here to learn a little bit about city administration. Learning a little bit about um, yeah, city administration and some operations in almost over a three-day period. So Exactly. Yeah. Thanks well, for having me. We're very happy to have you here. We hope that you learn a lot and would invite our council members to get a chance to meet you and that you could also uh, ask them any questions that you would have on your mind. So glad to have you here. Item four, miscellaneous agenda items. We will start with item A, which is our pandemic update. And we have a written report from Christy Campbell, so I will read through that now. And it says, Cole County's current vaccination rate is approximately 39% positive COVID cases and hospitalizations remain low. So I should say, i sorry, I just put my readers on, which I should have done before I started this meeting. The vaccination rate is approximately 39%. Positive COVID cases are low. COVID vaccines are available in many places. There are currently 14 locations in Cole County that offer COVID vaccinations. The Cole County Community Vaccination Site at the Capitol Mall offers vaccine on Thursdays. Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are currently available. You can register at covidvaccine.mo.gov or walk in anytime before 4 p.m. The community site will offer vaccinations until July 15th. JCMG and retail pharmacies also have vaccine available. Most retail pharmacies like Hy-Vee, Walmart, and Target are open every day and do not require an appointment. All locations in Missouri can be found on covidvaccine.mo.gov by clicking on the get a vaccine and then find a vaccine. Enter your zip code to find your vaccine locations near you. The Community Health Center of Central Missouri will be offering vaccines at all the mobile food pantry events in June. If there's any questions, you can call the Cole County Health Department at 636-2181 or visit colehealth.org. So does council have any questions or anything to add? So we do have uh, every two weeks, we have a meeting with uh, Christy and other hospital and health partners, and uh, they will be putting out a press release tomorrow that will include this information to share uh, with the community as well. And item B, we are going to recognize Sheila Perry and Kara Sankey of the Finance Department for the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report and Popular Annual Financial Report Awards. So I'd like to have Mr. Kroll and Ms. Miller to uh, present tonight. We'll have uh, Margie Miller come forward. She is the Director of Finance and Information Technology. And the uh, city's pleased to announce that we have again received the Governmental Finance Officers Association recognition for our comprehensive annual financial report and our popular annual financial report. 
That's correct. And Marty, Margie's going to go through a little bit of the information about it, but I, I just want to say the thanks to the mayor and city council for supporting the extra effort that it takes for uh, the city to provide that information. And it is a lot of extra effort um, by staff as well. And I think it also speaks um, well for the uh, information that's provided for citizens so they can uh, get a good idea of the financial information very comprehensively. So. So the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, established the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting back in 1945 to encourage and assist state local governments to go beyond the minimum requirements of generally accepted accounting principles to prepare an annual comprehensive financial report that evidences the spirit of transparency and full disclosure and then to recognize those individual governments that succeed in achieving that goal. So this certificate of achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. So the GFOA also established the popular annual financial report in 1991 to encourage and assist state and local governments to extract the information from their annual report to produce high quality popular annual financial reports specifically designed to be readily accessible and easily understandable to the general public and other interested parties without a background in public finance and then to recognize individual governments that are successful in achieving that goal. The eligible reports are reviewed by judges who complete an evaluation form that scores on categories such as overall quality and usefulness of the report, creativity, presentation, reader appeal, understandability, and distribution methods. And I just want to make something very clear Sometimes there is a misperception that because the annual comprehensive financial reports are audited by our external auditors, that the auditors are responsible for preparing this report, and that is not the case. Except for the auditor's opinion letter and an internal control and compliance letter, every page of this 146-page document is prepared by our finance staff. So congratulations to Sheila Perry, our chief accountant, and Kara Sankey, our senior accountant, for all of your hard work and attaining these high program standards. You want to introduce Allie as well? Yeah, we do have another finance staff person in the back, Allie Reese. She's fairly new with the city, but you may have seen her face. Congratulations. Thank you for such a wonderful team. And this award is something that we certainly enjoy celebrating. And it's not something we take for granted because we know that it is a lot of work that goes towards this. So you definitely make us proud that you continue to strive for this level of reporting and being able to attain the status for the city is a really big deal. It's very important. So we thank you for that. Um, and uh, we would like to, uh, we'll, we'll get a, a photo here opportunity with, with the award, but also wanted to mention that we also have, uh, it looks like, uh, Kara, that you will be uh, moving on for, uh, after 10 years of service to the city of Jefferson. Uh, you will be missed, but we wish you well in your new venture, and you've been uh, an amazing asset to the city at the time that you've been here. So uh, we appreciate that. Anything to add? Okay. Appreciate all the work, and you're welcome to come back and work on a couple of um, <laughs> comprehensive annual financial reports if uh, you know you really want to. Great. Well, thank you, and best wishes for you. We appreciate you, Kara, and uh, we appreciate all of the hard work that uh, that you all do. And we would like to uh, get a photo opportunity. So, if you all want to come forward, and you're welcome to come up as well. And then I would invite any council members who would want to participate in this photo opportunity are welcome to come behind me if they would choose to do so. Didn't 
All right, and item C is actually going to be on the next uh, city council agenda. Councilman, former Councilman Ken Hussey will be at our next meeting to introduce the Capital Improvements Sales Tax H Committee. So we are looking forward to that, which will be on the August 3rd ballot. Um, item five, public hearings, um, Mr. Marash. Thank you, uh, I thought I'd come up here and run through this presentation again. I you can see uh, these are at least the, the locations or the times we presented the same um, same document, our presentation back in February, March, and then now tonight. But uh, basically, it's the same same information. But if anybody's watching or pick up on the on these items, we could do it again. And, uh, and I'll be fairly quick, but uh, flag me down if you have a question, and uh, we'll just keep moving through it. But uh, just kind of our status, uh, we had a, a bond issuance back in 2010, and uh, we have util utilized all those funds. So uh, now we're basically on a cash basis, if you will. Uh, and then 2021, we're looking at that, and we've reduced our capital considerably. Uh, being on a cash basis, some of these are very expensive projects. Uh, you got to keep a certain amount of funds in the fund balance uh, through bond covenants and city covenants and various things. Uh, so we reduce that back and this they not only do projects but it, we buy heavy equipment with this things like that and uh, maintain our our facilities as well uh, pay our staff things like that uh, low interest money uh, right now from uh, missouri dnr uh, under one percent so that's pretty good uh, almost like spending uh, cash if you will on that type of thing so you know it's a good time to borrow money if uh, we have a rate structure in place and all the approvals so um sometimes you need to do that to keep your rates low so you know one one way we go about this or how we go about this is we look at our needs list and, and we come up uh, pretty easily with 44 million dollars and this isn't really comprehensive these are the biggies and of course we do other things out of cash every year as well as you all know probably uh but these are some of our big projects and then again we're looking for uh a project that would fit that srf funding criteria and we found you know the big one there the biosolids project out at the treatment plant uh 10 million dollar upgrade that would fit that nicely uh for some of the requirements so we think we if we could get approvals we could be successful in in getting that loan through the, through there but we could also do other type of bonding and loans as well just depending on how the financing goes so as we flip through this, if you avert your eyes, if you're squeamish, but uh, basically, why do we why do we do all these projects and keep up with this stuff? But you know, number one, it's a, you know, if we have issues with our sewer, that means uh, basically you have overflows or backups in people's basements, things like that, and uh, you know that's bad for the public health and bad for the environment. And so you know, the top one is a picture out of something here in town that backed up in somebody's house that came from the sewer main, not just their main, uh, and it went on down the hallway and it was pretty nasty stuff uh, we end up buying that it, that was actually in a uh, like a mobile home type thing so we end up buying that that whole thing from them and uh, because of this issue uh, but anyway the bottom one you know that's if you're out uh, in the woods and you come on a sewer manhole and it looks like this well obviously there's been an overflow that's bad for the environment too uh, and so anyway we have to report all these things as we, as we come upon them you ever smell a sewer odor and you're out walking or whatever i i do occasionally i'll call the sewer guys right away because we want to get it before it gets to be one of these things and so what's happening is the sewer is probably clogged in some fashion uh it's backing up whatever the issue so we want to go out there and investigate before we have something like this occur uh these lead to compliance issues with epa if you have enough of them and you're going to have some of them if you run a sewer system that's just in the cards but you want to keep them at a minimum uh but if we have too many, then, you know, you get in compliance issues, you start dealing with our DNR and EPA, and, you know, that has the potential really to affect your rates. Because what happens is you get in a compliance issue, they're going to start looking at your rates, comparing it to some other uh, things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically they say, well, maybe you're not charging enough because you're not doing enough projects uh, and you wouldn't have all these things uh, uh, hurting people's homes or the environment. So you have to do a lot of projects in a short amount of time, and that 
has the potential to really jack your rates up so you can borrow that money. Uh, and so we don't want to go there. We've been there in the, in the past. But, uh, you know, of course, deferred maintenance, uh, you know, costs more all the time. One thing I'll, I'll touch on here in a minute, but basically, you know, if, if uh, and our rates are considerably lower than this. So in Cole County, the median household income was right at $60,000 in 2019. And so a lot of times an indicator is, you know, what's about 2% of that for your wastewater rates. And, and that would be about $100 a month in Cole County. So we're, we're a lot lower than that now. But uh, so just give me an idea of some uh, rate comparisons. And these are really alphabetical instead of number order, but uh, just cities around us and here in Missouri. But again, that affordability, about 100 bucks there. And so you look at others' rates, we're right in there with Columbia right now. And you get big systems like ours and you get some economy of scale, right? And so, you know, we have this treatment plan over here, but we, we have capacity and that's why we'll make contracts with Holt Summit, for example, we're treating their waste or St. Martin's and all these other communities. But uh, as you go through that, we're about $34 a month right now. You can kind of see there where everybody else is falling, but you go down to St. Joe and, and we meet with these guys on a regular basis and gals at, uh, at our quarterly conference once COVID is over now, hopefully we get back to that. So we have a quarterly meeting with a lot of communities around around the state, and it usually occurs right here in Jefferson City, so it's easy for us to get to. Uh, but uh, we know kind of what their enforcement actions look like, so we can kind of keep track of each other. Uh, but their their bill was greatly increased after that. So uh, we're trying to avoid something like that in Jefferson City, and we have in the past by doing this. Uh, Wardsville, you know, they've sold out recently to Missouri American Water Company, so they have a tariff that goes through the Public Service Commission, which is an office down downtown Jefferson City. Um, and, and so we know their rates are being proposed just under $70 a month. I'm not sure if they're actually implemented at that right now. They might be since I've done this several months ago. Uh, and Taos is actually another one that's getting ready to sell. If you caught the article in the paper maybe two or three weeks ago um, that they're selling to Missouri American. They, they at one time were in discussions with Jefferson City many years ago. I was involved in those. And they ended up going their own direction. Now they've decided, well, now their enforcement actions and things like that, and their system needs some maintenance. And so they're they're selling to Missouri American. They're going to end up with about probably the same rate there, except about seventy dollars a month for their average household. And they, you know, everybody's a little different. It's based on water usage, but we're just trying to do some averages. So, um, so there's two ways to go about this: pay as you go. That's don't borrow money and just try to pay it as you go. Uh, and so we look at that 44 million of projects we, we think we should be doing. And uh, right now, you know, we're up here at about 31. Now, something that you probably got a letter from, I believe Ed Racker sent something to the council about people outside the city, even though they're part of our system, uh, they're billed at a little higher rate. So they, they get uh, multiples of the base rate, we call it, plus water usage. And so if you're outside the city, uh, you're paying about compared if you're inside and this is based on i want to say 4400 gallons of flow where eric's here with me yeah so if you're using 4400 gallons of water on your water bill this would be your rate and uh and so we just compared those across so if you're outside the city currently you're about 54 dollars a month and that's coming to us but we have to drive outside the city maintain those facilities and things of that nature. And we take responsibility for those, maintain all those easements. Uh, and so it's, it is fair to charge a little more to go outside the city uh, and do that. Uh, St. Martin's, again, they have a little bit different deal. They own the infrastructure, we help maintain it and things like that. But, uh, so theirs is slightly different based on some of those considerations. The, uh, and they have a long, I think uh, we, we had an annexation agreement, which some of this factored into a long, several years ago. And so, that's where that rate came from. We also have another rate. I didn't put it in here because it's uh, the city of Holt Summit pays it based on flow, a flow meter. So that's that goes into our fund. But it, you know, these are household individuals here. Uh, but it pays you go, and and so we kind of started looking at okay, how can we do some of these improvements and broke them down? You know, the first few years, and you get down to about 2027, which is what our rate table is here. We're talking about. And our outside the city uh, customers start hitting that hundred dollars a month. Now, not the lawyer in the room, but you might start generating lawsuits. Uh, hey, it's unaffordable. What are you guys doing to us? Uh, things like that, because really this council gets to decide what the rates are. And, uh, and so you often hear, you might hear that, hey, I don't have good representation about this. So, um, 
But anyway, and so you can see where the city's rates go over time. And so, you know, you look here at the bottom, oops, pointer going down in here. So, you know, you kind of did the percents over here. So in, in this pay as you go option by 2027, you still can't afford all the 44 million, but you go from 0.63% of, of your uh, medium household income to about a percent and a half uh, over those uh, few years. And so uh, fairly steep rate increases, but it would, you can still get there, but it, it starts getting pretty steep. So we compare that to if we uh, estimated uh, what we could bond these or borrow money and do these same capital improvements to the whole 44 million. And this is what's reflected. This is our recommendation in the rate table. But up here, so if you were to implement this as uh, uh, what we have in the council agenda, 2% this year and then 5% thereafter, uh, you can kind of see where we're at. We go from 0.63 currently to 0.86 over that uh, uh, what uh, six year period, six, seven year period. And that is again, based on 2019 median household income. So in Cole County, statewide average about a percent and a half. So you can kind of see the, the differences there. We get, we get more money to do projects and try to keep up with our system uh, and keep our rates much lower. So that's why it's the preferred option. Nobody wants to pay any more for what goes down the drain, right? Um, basically, in the council agenda tonight, we had introduced it already, and Ryan can help me out on this. I was a little foggy on how this worked, but but basically, we we introduced this already at that time. I think because of this hearing needing to happen and certain um, advertising requirements, uh, we, we it had to be put off until this time at this council meeting. Uh, so it's been introduced with the with the decision tonight. So it's in the it's in your packet of what that looks like. I didn't include it here. Uh, assuming the council adopts the rate table, you know, the next step we start talking about, well, how do we actually then go about uh, doing some of that bonding? Because then there's things like uh, if you want to do SRF money, you have to have an election to, to see if you can go in debt. The public would support that based on this rate table we're adopting. But uh, And if you look at the rate table, it's not as maybe uh, it's a little uh, less intuitive than this where uh, it's, it shows how much we're charging per cubic foot of water usage. So that's just a way that these water companies measure their water usage. So we convert that to get to these numbers. But so this is a little more straightforward here. Question. Sure. So, so how do you figure the rates for folks that are on a well system? Uh, well, there's some availability and maybe Eric can answer some of these more technical questions, but assumption based on the occupancy of the state just tell us uh, how many seniors so uh, state criteria and do we have a do we have data that know that we know who how, or how many people are on a, on their own water system well well system so approximately 200 customers that are on wells <laughs> we have two a, Approximately 200 customers that are on wells. So that are using the system. Right. Any other questions? Councilwoman uh, Ward. Um, I learned from city staff that you look at usage January through March, um, and that determines the amount they're going to pay for the entire year. Um, in those events where there is like a change in someone's family makeup that creates a hardship within that household or there was something like a running toilet for a really long time that increased their water usage um, is there any type of protocol in place that the city uses to address looking at usage at another time i mean eric and i did discuss this but just to, to share for the public right and just on the first part of that i'll say the reason it's done in those three months uh, uh so if your water meter's out there and you're washing your car that doesn't obviously go down the drain so we're not treating that water things like that or you're watering uh, maybe out of the same spigot that you use in the house maybe you're watering your lawn whatever you're doing that way you're not charged for that water going down the system because you would do those activities in the summertime, obviously not in the wintertime, typically. So the second part about that. Right, for residential customers, um, all we need, uh, if you have a leak or something like that, it occurs between January and March, all we need is a copy of a plumber's uh, bill 
So uh, we're, we allow the, uh, to, I'm sorry, the evaluation <laughs> of the bill to uh, adjust it that way. And then uh, commercial customers, if they have uh, cooling water or things like that that don't go down the drain and it's metered, then we allow that as well. So we help, uh, we, we try to make it fair for the residential and the commercial customers. Yeah, that's a good point on the commercial. So we'll get people, hey, you know, uh, may they get a new facility or they're moved into a new facility and they, uh, and this is this actually happened uh, where, hey, you know, we're using all this water, but a lot of it's cooling water, you know, in their HVACs. And so, we, you know, we work with them to get that remetered a different way so they could reduce their bill. So, but it's kind of case by case basis, I guess we'd say. So we're not so large, we can't kind of look at those things. Councilman Fitzwater. Yes, I've seen this a couple of times. I appreciate it. don't think I've asked this question before, but if I'm reading this table right in the ordinance, we had a three or four year gap where we didn't increase the rates. Am I reading that correct? Four years, yes. Why we uh, didn't? Just like this is probably, if anything, uh, you know, so to afford the capital we're talking about, we, we figured, okay, we can go through 2027 just like this, and this would be adopted uh, uh, to get to get that level of capital improvement. Same was done last time through 2017. Uh, the thought was, okay, give everybody a deep breath. We'll look, evaluate our needs again and come back. That ended up being four years later. Now, in reality, what I learned from dealing with our consultant who helped us develop this actually, uh, a rate consultant uh, that's done work for the city in the past, uh, Raftillis, they, uh, they said, oh man, if you guys only would have uh, kept up with 2% a year, you know, we could have knocked some of those fives down a little bit, uh, maybe, but, you know, so we're kind of playing catch up a little bit for those four years of relief. Well, that was my point. Yeah. That we went four years without a rate increase. So some of what we're doing is a catch up because we had been fairly consistent, small increases, four year gap, and now we're doing a little bit to make up to meet what we need is that an act am i reading it right yeah that's that's totally right and i think uh eric you can help me out on the our last rate table uh what were the percentages roughly they were higher six, yeah they were actually six at that time so we we tried to work with our consultant and said okay let's try to max out at five as you can see on the table and see how does that how does that get us there you know and not and do kind of something incrementally this yet this year and uh, go from there. So that that was our criteria. You know, you can slice this different ways. Uh, now all this is assuming. So what happened? I go back to the rate table uh, in that time. So uh, I think it was 2013. We had the EPA issue. Yeah. So in 2013, we had a compliance issue. We had that rate table in place. So we were able to work with the regulators at that time and say, okay, uh, we'll do. We'll promise to do all these projects in the next so many years and uh, pay this fine or get this fine suspended because we're going to do this instead, things like that. And so by having this in place, we could, we could uh, promise we would do those quickly. And, uh, and the regulators bought off on that, so we didn't have to adjust anybody's rates. So again, having, having something like this in place in case something were to happen besides what we need to do, uh, we can always have a little flexibility with our regulators so that something, we get in a compliance issue again, hopefully we'll be able to come out of that and not not go too far with our rates. Any other questions? Okay, at this point, we will open the public hearing portion. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on Bill 2020-75? Okay, seeing none, we will take up the associated Bill 2020-75. This is, uh, do we have one online? Any questions online? Okay. Uh, Mrs. Donaldson? An ordinance amending Chapter 29, Sewers and Sewage Disposal of the Code of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by adjusting sewer rates. Any council discussion, deliberation questions? Roll call, please. Fitzwater? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Spencer? Aye. Spicer? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Bill passes. Um, item six, appointments by the mayor. This is Strope. Thank you. So we recently created the Historic Preservation Code Revision Committee. Um, this is an ad hoc committee, and so we would like to recommend appointments to that committee. 
the following individuals are recommended. Donna Dietz, Brad Schaefer, Dr. Deborah Green, Reverend Cassandra Gould, Glover Brown, Stacy Young, Holly Stitt, Dr. Roger Youngmeyer, Doug Record, and Steve Viley. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Any further discussion? And I do have a question. After this, do we appoint a city liaison to the board? Planning and zoning. Uh, Right, I think that is the planning and zoning liaison would serve. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I noticed it. it's on the agenda for planning and zoning. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item seven, presentations from staff consultants invited guests. We have none this evening. Item eight, announcements by mayor, council, and staff. Our committee meetings are scheduled on jeffersoncitymo.gov under the calendar and we have four standing committees are there any uh, council reports this evening for council committees councilman schreiber yes madam mayor uh, the public safety meeting will be moved uh, for this month be tuesday june the 29th at 7 30 at the hyde park facility fire facility and we moved it because we didn't want to interfere with the uh, finance committee meeting that's at the schedule for the same time on Thursday, normally when we have our meeting. So Tuesday, 629, 730 at Hyde Park for public safety. Okay, any other committee reports? Councilman Fitzwater? Looking at Mab, I think we're on for this Thursday, June the 10th at 730 here at City Hall. And right now, public works. fairly short list of topics thank you any other committee reports um, and item b mr sanders thank you madam mayor uh, activate jefferson city 2040 is the name of the draft comprehensive plan coming before the uh, this thursday uh, it's the first major update in 25 years to the comprehensive plan a total rewrite uh, the planning and zoning commission has uh, been actively involved in of development of this so have stakeholders and other members of the community uh, so uh, we're having one uh, public hearing uh, we've had several other public events but we're having a public hearing uh, this Thursday before the Planning and Zoning Commission where they may consider adopting the, uh, the plan I'd like to invite everybody um, it uh, will be in this room at 515 it's also available online and uh, you can go to the city's website to find out more about it there's a link in the upper left hand uh, column of some of the buttons on the city's homepage. Glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay, and Mr. Marash has an announcement for a ribbon cutting. Yes, thank you. Uh, so tomorrow we'll have a uh, ribbon cutting for the East High Street project. That was a city county project. Uh, it's been done for a little while now, but we, we finally got all the punch list items done and actually this uh, uh, item on the um, consent agenda about a permissive use right away is some residents wanting to put a new fence in that's on the right away as a result of that project. but. The, uh, it'll be tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and it'll be held over at uh, High and Riverside there by East School. Thank you. And Councilman Kemna is going to tell us about Porch Fest. Yeah, um, Porch Fest is back on uh, Capitol Avenue um, starting Sunday. It's uh, from 1 to 4. Um, I think the weather is looking good for this event. Um, it's a family-friendly event where they'll have art stations, arts and crafts. Um, they'll have food vendors. They'll have music, live music on the porches. Um, I'm not sure. If, are you are you attending this year? Unfortunately, I uh, could not make it work this time. But oh. Maybe next time. But if you're a free Sunday, come join us at Porch Fest. Thank you, Councilman Kemna. And I also want to recognize as the uh, liaison to Parks and Rec that uh, you, I know that you have done a lot of work on the amphitheater and there was uh, the second big uh, concert was held Friday night and the Little River Band was there and it was very well attended and I had countless people come up to me and compliment me on the venue and while I enjoy hearing the compliments I wanted to share um, that and of course many local people and people who said they had visited from uh, cities uh, from 100 miles away or more and so that was nice to hear that. Um, and then Kids Fest was held there Saturday after being gone for two years in a row. So it was nice to be back and to have it moved to Riverside Park was a great venue. So I was able to participate in that and it was a great crowd and a perfect day, but tying it in with the amphitheater was an absolutely perfect venue. So 
I appreciate your work with the foundation or parks commission on that, Councilman Kemna. And uh, a couple of my announcements. I'll announce uh, Sketch Day is having a reception this coming Thursday, June 10th. It's co-sponsored by Capital Arts and Historic City of Jefferson. It will be held at the Capital Arts building outside, which is near the ice arena. And uh, that's June 10th, and it will be uh, in person outside or live on Facebook. It starts at 5.30. The Sketch Day Awards are at 6. And um, so we hope that you will uh, tune in to that. A few things going on this week. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, June 8th, is the Sheriff's Barbecue. So if you have not purchased your tickets, be sure to talk with John Wheeler and tell him I said that. Uh, also, tomorrow night is... Uh, First Impact Program, which is parent education for new drivers. That will be tomorrow evening, Tuesday at 6 p.m., held in the police department training room. Sergeant Rudiger will be there uh, as well, and I know that's something that uh, the uh, traffic safety, especially for new drivers, is a very important topic for parents, so if they want to tune into that, of course, uh, hands-free, buckle up, phone down, distracted driving is an important topic, so uh, that will all be uh, covered tomorrow evening. Are there any council, any other council announcements? Okay, and um, item nine, Lincoln University student representative update. Uh, we don't have Mr. Stacy Landis with us this evening, uh, but I did wanna mention that uh, Dr. John Mosley, who's been named interim president of Lincoln University has been invited to come to an upcoming city council meeting and he plans to bring his team here with him. So we will uh, look forward to having Dr. Mosley here. Um, item 10, presentations from the gallery on specific bills or resolutions that are limited to five minutes. We do have some people signed up this evening. We'll start with Mr. Matt Green. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, I appreciate you hearing my remarks tonight. Um, I apologize for coming into the meeting a little late. I couldn't find any place to park. That's a joke. <laughs> Parking garage, that's what I'm uh, here to plead my case about. Um, I'm a downtown business owner. Um, I went to high school here, went to college here. I was Jay and a Blue Tiger. Um, I, I love the downtown and I love Jefferson City from east to west. And I think it's pretty crucial that we grow the town everywhere. And it's really tough for the downtown to grow, in my opinion, without plenty of ample parking. Um, and I don't know that anyone here in this room can ever say that um, they've never heard anyone complain about the parking downtown. I don't think it's horrible, but I do think it is a little limiting for big groups to come and visit basically any business downtown or the Capitol grounds. Um, and uh, I just I think that the parking garage would be a really great amenity that would be used for a long time. And, um, and, uh, and, I, and I'm all for it. So I just wanted to keep it brief and let everyone know, um, especially my two council members. I'm a, I'm a resident of the West End neighborhoods in the third ward. Um, so uh, I appreciate uh, you hearing my thoughts on the matter. Have a great night, cheers. Thank you. Next we have Mrs. Natalie Newbill. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie Newville. I'm here as a representative of the Downtown Association, also speaking on the parking garage. Um, I We wrote a letter. You all have gotten that, so I'm not really going to revisit a lot of that. But um, we just wanted to make sure we were able to come and let everyone know our support for the project, um, not only as it benefits downtown, but as it benefits the entire city of Jefferson. Uh, we see a lot of benefit to having more parking options available. We can see it really helping our economy. Um, so we're very excited about the potential of it. Um, we're thrilled with the city staff and the work they've done and all of the research that's gone into this. Um, and we are very, very supportive of it. We're happy to answer any questions anyone may have regarding um, parking situation or anything else that has to do with downtown. We wanna be a resource and work with everyone and uh, really tackle this issue together. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jack Deacon. Welcome. 
Thank you, Ellen. My name is Jack Deacon. I reside at 236 South Bluff Street. Um, I'm coming here to speak about the parking garage. I first want to know if the council ever decide if it's our function of the city to provide parking for the state government. If it is, then maybe this could go ahead and go on. But um, And also, are we a function to uh, are the city's job is to make money off of parking? That That's a philosophical question that the council has to answer. In my mind, this needs more deliberation. I would love to see it stay on the informal calendar, as Mr. Fitzwater, I think I heard you say that. But more importantly, I was just driving through the downtown. If we went to diagonal parking on Capitol Avenue, we could pick up 90 spaces. McCarty Street, you could pick up 90 spaces. On Jefferson, 60 spaces. I mean, that's 150 places right there. If the central uh, bank loses that lot or leaves it, there's 60 right there. There's almost, what did I say, one, two, almost 300 spaces, 250 parking spaces without doing anything. Even just if, well, the bank would have to lease those spaces to someone. Or if we bought that, God forbid, I don't, I don't want to take it off the tax rolls either. That's another, another point. I'm rambling here a little bit. But I, I really think we have to deliberate on this. Where is our parking needs? Do we need to spend, what, $12, $13 million for a parking garage? Or can we just spend a, a few thousand and restripe our, our city, see if the, if the diagonal parking works? then fine, then we don't have to do it. If it doesn't work, if we're still screaming for parking, then go ahead. I don't think the building is going to go for sale for a long time. I don't know if the parking lot will go for sale for a long time, but it's still sitting there. I don't I don't think we need it. Definitely, we don't need it for, for retail uptown. That, that's, that's at a wrong location, and retail is just, it's just not there, going to be there for a while. But if we're going to do it for the state, I think we should first re, reconfigure our parking and just think about it. Let it die on the well, put it on the informal calendar, maybe let it die, but just decide what's our philosophy, where are we going to park, and uh, do we really want to take this off the tax rolls? Any, any questions? Thank you. All right. One, one more. With the diagonal parking, it works almost every city we go to. We travel all over the United States with our kids. Columbia's got horrible streets, narrow, lots of traffic on, on Broadway, and they go diagonal, and there's no problem there. On our side, we don't have to do it on High Street. That would be improbable, but. My gosh, Jefferson, McCarty, and Capitol Avenue, those are simple. I mean, we have plenty of room there. And uh, once again, I hate to take it off the tax rolls. We lose that money there. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Amy Rogers. Did you not want to talk this evening? Okay, no problem. Is there anyone else here this evening that is here to speak on this item that has not signed up? And is there anyone online or call in? Okay, with that, we will go on to consent agenda item 11. Is there a motion to approve? So, so second. second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Bill's introduced, item 12. We have Bill 13, Chief Schofield. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Donaldson. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an $82,649 agreement with GNR Construction of Tipton, Missouri, for a roof replacement project at Fire Station 3, 302 Rock Hill Road. Chief Schofield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a, uh, a construction contract, uh, as the clerk indicated, for a, a replacement of the roof at Fire Station Number 3. This is a been a longstanding issue since our hailstorm on the west end of town last March and so we've, we've done some emergency repairs to the roof and this is a, a full roof replacement when we went this out to bid originally uh, we, we didn't get a lot of response and um, we decided that to bring the best options and, and to fully investigate uh, what the, the lowest cost best option would be for the council that we decided to put it back out to bid again uh, we did get additional responses uh, but we also put it out to bid in, in such a way that we wanted to define whether or not a uh, metal roof would be feasible. We do have a, a metal roof on fire station number two, and, and we're pleased with that. Uh, wanted to explore that option. Uh, so what you have in front of you is a um, contract that, that shows um, that bid tab uh, for the, uh, the lowest and best for the asphalt roof <coughs> with GNR construction out of Tipton, Missouri. The, the next closest bid for a, a metal roof as a possibility is significantly higher. Have that in the in the bid tab, but it's approximately sixty-five thousand dollars more. So, our our recommendation, based on the the previous funding that was approved, um, was uh, 
for uh, $85,000 in funding. So to fit into that, um, that amount of available funds, we're recommending uh, the asphalt roof uh, to be provided by GNR Construction. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Councilman Schreiber? Thank you. There's been a request to suspend the rules. Are there any objections? Seeing none, we will take up 2021-13. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an $82,649 agreement with GNR Construction of Tipton, Missouri, for a roof replacement project at Fire Station 3, 302 Rock Hill Road. Any further council deliberation? I just have a question. Yes. For Chief Schofield. What is the lifespan on the asphalt shingles that's being used? Are they 20 year, 30 year? They're a commercial months? grade asphalt sh shingle uh, made by Owens Corning. It is a, equivalent to be what a 30 year roof would be on a, a residential shingle. Okay. Yeah, and there are also some additional stipulations for wind speed. We wrote that spec uh, for Fire Station 5. Pretty happy with that product okay. for the replacement of Fire Station 5's roof. Okay, thank you. Councilman Spencer? Um, being a new council person, could I get a little bit of, a, of, of an update or information as far as how we are covered as far as our structures, our stations, buildings, due to, is it, are we self-insured basically, I guess is my question. Do we have insurance? Yeah, so uh, the city maintains a policy um, on, on property and equipment. Um, and, and yeah, so we, we carry insurance on all our properties. Um, there is a, um, a insurance recovery on this, uh, particular structure. Um, and so, uh, I don't have those numbers right off hand. I'd be happy to get them for you, uh, um, uh, tomorrow, but, uh, essentially we are not self-insured, but we do carry a, um, Gail, help me out if I mess this up, a 1% deductible based on the value of the building and a minimum $20,000 deductible for um, for essentially storm damage. Um, that is the, that's about as best as you can get it from the industry. Right now we've, we've tried to do better than that. Um, so, so we're not self-insured, but we do carry a, uh, what turns out to be a fairly high deductible when they are, uh, when buildings are damaged by weather events. Um, and so, uh, but for this project, there is uh, both a, a, a insurance claim amount that's already been paid and some recoverable depreciation that we'll receive once the, uh, once the project is done and we'll actually turn this work in uh, to, the, uh, to the insurance company to uh, uh, cover some additional amounts because this bid actually came in higher than what the uh, the estimator uh, um, you know uh, paid us. So yes, sorry, the adjuster, not the estimator. The adjuster uh, uh, pegged this project for. So there is some recovery for this that that will help offset this amount. And I'd be happy to get those numbers uh, to you uh, sometime tomorrow. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Deliberation. Roll call, please. Hensley. Aye. Kimna. Aye. Lester. Aye. Schreiber. Spencer? Aye. Spicer? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Bill passes. 2021-14. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with corrective asphalt materials in the amount of $97,002.90 for the 2021 street seal coating project. Mr. Marash. Thank you. And I think the clerk explained it pretty well. Basically, it's a construction contract. Uh, uh, one item is that we're uh, piggybacking, if you will, off the contract City of Moberly let for this t the same type work. Uh, they got a good bid. Basically, uh, this is one one of the projects in our asphalt overlay contract. Uh, you may recall that annually we spend approximately $1.2 million on overlay type projects. This is in, inside of that. About 100000 of it goes to the seal coat 
what happens is uh, we're going back about a year after we overlaid the street and then sealing up any fine cracks to help us reduce reduce potholes and extend the life of that pavement once it's once it's laid. Thank you. Any questions? 2021 uh, 15 has been withdrawn. 2021 16. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Cook, Flat, and Strobel Engineers PA in the amount of $50,000 for the transit facilities feasibility study. Mr. Marash. Thank you. And uh, again, $50,000 contract, uh, 40000 of that would come through a planning grant through Campo, administered through Campo. Uh, 10000 would be from the transit uh, CIP funds uh, for this project. And it says a feasibility study, but uh, when you get down to it, it's really a, a facility study, the uh, transit facilities. It's our office space and, and things of that nature uh, located on Miller Street. And then also our central maintenance uh, facilities being looked at. And if we could, is there a way to separate those two, uh, gain more space, our gas pumps, all of those things located over off Miller Street have all been paid through transit funds in the past from the early 80s. They're due for some updates. They're costing a lot of maintenance at this point. But once we get this done uh, uh, and determine where that goes, the then we'd be in a position to apply for actual grants through transit again to reconstruct these facilities. And that's how they were built originally. Any questions? 2021-17. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Cole County setting procedures for the Grant Street sidewalk and roadway joint city and county capital improvement project. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, again, this is a very similar type agreement we've uh, had with Cole County over the years. It kind of lays out who administers the projects and, and really it comes down to the city administers these projects, uh, city staff uh, through our engineering division, but basically uh, we'd bid a project, things like that. Uh, and it also outlines the, the relative planning level costs. So for the, in this case, we're talking about the Grant Street sidewalk project. It's a five or six foot sidewalk that runs along Grant Street, about 2,000 feet long. Uh, also some work at the entrance to the new amphitheater at the Riverside Park. And uh, uh, so part of, as part of the county's uh, $5.5 million commitment to do projects inside the city, uh, this would tag about 550,000 of that for this project. And then uh, the remainder, the remaining 100 would come from the parks department for projects. Uh, our engineering department designed the, designed the project and uh, have to answer any questions. Any questions? 2021-18. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, <clears throat> authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Cole County setting procedures for the MSP joint city and county capital improvement project. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, kind of a companion, but basically outlining that the city would be responsible for implementing this project and spending, and, you know, the county would then contribute the funds, but but uh, it, they would go towards the MSP project, and we've talked about this at several meetings, but uh, the city did get the uh, EDA grant, we refer to it as Economic Development Administration Grant for infrastructure at the MSP site, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, we had enough to cover the grant, but... Uh, uh, with the excess funds now available from the Clark Dunklin that we had originally contemplated, uh, we'll be able to shift those funds here, fulfill all our commitments that uh, we have with the state for getting the property there. And so the total project ended up be about four and a half million dollars. The county would contribute their one million five hundred fifty three thousand, a little more, and uh, then the city uh, portion of that uh, one point or excuse me five point five million dollar commitment for city county projects would be about one point four for this this project, and then of course the grant at one point five. So uh, all of that would build streets and various infrastructures and uh, clearing stormwater, sidewalk, lighting, et cetera. Any questions? 2021-19. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending the fiscal year 2021 budget of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by appropriating additional funds within the general fund. Mr. Helmick. Thank you. Um, we're going to actually present on both uh, 19 and 20. Uh, so I don't know if you need to read that. Sure. 2021-20, an ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending the fiscal year 2021 budget of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by appropriating additional funds within the general fund. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the code enforcement programs made great strides over the last couple of years, increasing the number of violation notices that we've issued 
um, improving voluntary compliance and increasing proactiveness. Um, with an increased budget, the staff can continue making great strides in code enforcement without negatively affecting the other areas of operation. This supplemental request uh, would fund the estimated abatement of nuisances for the remainder of this fiscal year without depleting other funding categories. Our average for the last six years is about $38,000 a year that we spend on abatements. As you can see by the chart that's included with the uh, documents, um, we have been able to decrease those over the last four years. So far this year, we're at $12,454. With that $15,000 or $15, supplemental appropriation, it puts us in line with what we spent in fiscal year 2020. Those funds, um, we do recover a significant amount of them through tax liens, personal judgments, and uh, bills that are sent to the owners of the property. Um, average is about 160% we have with the administrative fees that we charge as well. Um, any questions on the abatement part before we move forward? So dangerous buildings. Purpose of the dangerous buildings ordinance is provide a just equitable practice for repairing, ordering the vacation of, or demolition of buildings or structures that endanger life. These are properties that are dangerous. They're not just properties that look bad. We are able to uh, demolish four structures in the fiscal year 2020. Uh, due to a supplemental appropriation that we received from funds that were left over the demolition of 200 East High. Um, one of those properties was 112 East Ashley. It was a fire burn, total loss, it was a site of multiple trespassings and illegal activities. Um, you can see the before and afters. 1001 Washington um, had structural issues as well as uh, hazardous materials inside. It is now a, a green grass lot. 1421 St. Mary's was in a partial collapse. We were able to uh, remove that structure and it's now uh, an open green lot. And 519 East Capitol. Um, this structure was collapsing from the back, also had further storm damage. It was about eight inches from the white structure on the, the right side that was occupied. Um, and now it's, it's an empty lot with uh, grass growing on it. The only one that we were able to fund with our 2021 uh, demolition budget was 1324 East Miller. This is a property where the back half of the structure, as you can see, was falling into the neighboring property, which was a multifamily occupied structure. Um, so we used our entire abatement budget for demolitions for this year to remove that structure. The process of the city code to declare buildings dangerous and a nuisance have been followed already for 209 Jackson, 405 East Capitol, 108 Jackson, 500 East Ashley, 410 East Hesway, and also we're adding 320 uh, East Miller to that. Um, those buildings have been ordered for demolition. They've been through the hearing process and they're ready to go. Um, we have 11 properties that are already through the entire process just waiting funding. We have another 13 as of when I presented this to the Finance Committee and have actually added two more since then. So we're sitting at about 27 properties that are going to need to be demolished over the next years. With the current budget that we have and it being at zero dollars for this fiscal year, we just continue developing a backlog. Some of the properties that we're looking at for demolition using this supplemental appropriation, uh, 320 East Miller, the roof is falling. The entire side of the structure is starting to cave in on the side that's about two and a half feet from an occupied multifamily home. 431 West Miller, uh, this one is uh, consistently getting broken into. When uh, PD went there to clear it, we determined that the structure has significantly um, deteriorated since the last time we were there. You can see the floors are rotting out, the ceilings are falling in. Um, so this one's actually been moved up the list to one that's a priority now. Uh, 410 East Hesway is a complete fire burn with uh, no insurance proceeds. Uh, also the site of trespassing and illegal activities. 108 Jackson, um, roof collapse in the front and back. Um, as you can see, the plywood keeps getting plied off the doors and windows. Um, allowing people to squat inside and, and do different activities. Four or five East Capitals had a complete roof collapse um, and it is uh, close to the sidewalk. And again, we have issues with people breaking into the structure. 
Um, anytime a structure is broken into, that requires code enforcement as well as PD to go through the structure, clear it, make sure there's no people left inside, and then resecure that structure, which then uses our abatement budget on top of risking the lives of fire, PD, code enforcement, and others. 209 Jackson, uh, this one, the chimneys are collapsing. The entire inside of the structure is completely rotted out. This is approximately eight feet from a, an alleyway. And also the property on the left is getting rehabbed right now, um, which is Ivy Terrace, which means we're gonna have an increase in traffic and foot traffic in that area. So this one moved up as far as priorities go as well. Uh, besides those ones that I gave as examples, we do have 20 some others that are, are either through the process or as of July 20th, when I have my next round of hearings that will be ready to go through the process. Um, this is a very active list. We do move buildings up and down as we determine there's further deterioration, there's, there's issues with life safety. Um, so the ones that we gave you are an example of what we could do with the supplemental appropriation. But if something happens tomorrow, we might have to switch some of those depending on what's best for the community and, and as far as the neighborhood goes. So with that, I know through, I went through it quickly, but I will answer any questions if anybody has. Thank you. Any questions? Councilman Fitzwater? I don't really have a question. I just have a couple of comments and I appreciate that presentation. I've heard it a couple of times. I think this is a critical issue for our city and I appreciate the work that has gone into the presentations. One of the questions we did ask, or someone asked it at the meetings, by virtue of a larger block of money, could they use economy of scale? So instead of doing these projects one at a time, could we send out RFPs for a large number of projects? So I know, I think this started at 150,000, it was amended to 200,000 at some point. I certainly support that. And if there's an opportunity to take that number even higher, I would support that. I think this is something visible that our community sees every day, especially in a very critical corridor, Capitol Avenue and streets off of that. So I commend the staff for their work on this and for bringing the project list to us. I don't know what availability of additional dollars, but. I would support taking that number even higher if it's possible before we vote on it. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so we'll take this up at our next meeting. Thank you. 2020, 20, I'm sorry, 2021, 20, 21. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, vacating and discontinuing a portion of an unnamed right of way in the portion of Marshall Street, south of East Dunklin Street. Mr. Molman. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, on ordinance 21, um, so in uh, doing further homework on that, um, it looks like that this particular vacation may be something that we have already done as part of the community park project. Um, so we're going to dig into those documents and, and, and see uh, it wasn't uh, completely apparent, but um, uh, I have staff telling me that, that that was part of a package of the overall easements over part of the uh, community project, community park project a couple of years ago. Um, so um, um, we're going to dig into that a little bit, and, but uh, that may be something that we request the sponsor to withdraw for the next meeting. So hopefully we don't need to worry about that one okay. uh, in particular. And number 22, Mr. Molman. Uh, so 22 is a ordinance that would vacate um, the right of way that is within the block of the city hall complex. Uh, so generally uh, it's called Hanley Way. Uh, from Adams Street to Monroe, and then uh, the unnamed alley that runs from Miller um, to the police parking lot. And so this uh, this ordinance started as a request from the police department, um, and, and essentially it's security concerns. So um, when a piece of property is designated as right of way, um, right of way um, designates that that uh, that property is open to the public to the traveling public and so um so when when something is a street 
Um, it, 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 the courts say that those uh, streets are generally open to the public for things uh, for like trans traversing the property for uh, free speech activities. Um, and, and, you know, essentially it allows people to be back there. Um, and so uh, in addition to being an alleyway that, you know, serves the function of moving streets from Monroe to Adams, it also serves a very important operational um, function for city hall, municipal court, and for most importantly, police. And so police had concerns that essentially because it's a street, they can't, you know, really control who's back there. We have police cars back there. We have police, uh, you know, uh, personal vehicles back there. We have, uh, you know, our fleet of public works and, uh, and planning public planning and protective services vehicles all back there. And its nature as a as an alleyway, as a public street, means that we can't exclude people from being back there. It's essentially, they would have the right to be back there. And that poses all types of concerns from a security aspect. And so what this ordinance would do would, would vacate it and it would essentially turn it back into a fee simple property that is owned by the city as a property owner and not as the government. And so that way, as a property owner, we can say, you know, this alleyway is for official city business or official police business. Um, and that if, if the need arose, we are able to exclude people from that uh, property um, in a more effective and legally sound way than if we uh, were trying to exclude people from the public right away. And so, um, so this request originate with the police, ran through my office, and uh, it's here for the city council's consideration, but it's, it's really from the safety and security aspect that we're asking the city council to uh, vacate these public ways. Thank you. I'll have Mrs. Donaldson read the bill and then we'll take questions. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, vacating and discontinuing the right of way in in lot 610 from Hanley Way Alley and Adams Street to Monroe Street and the 20 foot alley from Miller Street that attaches perpendicularly to the Hanley Way Alley. Are there any questions, comments? A 2021-23. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, adding a new article to the transportation code and approving a form license agreement. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. So this ordinance really accomplishes two things. So the first thing it does is it implements some new regulations regarding scooter ride sharing businesses. Um, the the uh, term and denom, if you will, um, is small vehicle shared active transportation operation, but I just call it scooters. Um, and so what this does, this uh, uh, adds a new article to our transportation code, which um, um, addresses both licensure of scooter scooter rental companies and then also some operational standards. Uh, so generally, uh, scooters uh, fall within the definition of bicycles um, in our more general codes, but these uh, these operational standards would apply to uh, scooters um, when they are being used as part of an overall business. Um, and so they have both uh, operational standards, you know, things like, uh, you know, don't ride on sidewalks, right on streets and greenways that are a minimum of 10 feet wide, don't hang off the back, um, you know, don't, don't use in, in, in weather, weather where it is uh, dangerous. Um, riders are required to take a photo when they park their small vehicles and turn it in, uh, essentially upload it to the, to the mobile app. Uh, and then a, a variety of parking regulations, because I think everyone realizes after our last experience that kind of the big thing with the scooters is the parking of the scooters. And so this code uh, requires that the parking be done in a way that doesn't, um, that minimally affects the uh, the sidewalks and, and, and tries to ensure that there are uh, throughways still on the, uh, on the sidewalks for pedestrians and other users of the sidewalks. Um, the other thing that this does is that it approves a form license agreement. And so if we, we, we return back to our conversations in front of the city council about these scooter programs, what the city council essentially said is that the city council was not interested in authorizing a single franchise exclusive um, uh, scooter company, the only one to operate within the city, rather to have a more open um, uh, uh, program where anyone who um, comes into the city and wants to operate a scooter program and comply with some general uh, regulations is is able to um, is able to uh, 
uh, you know, do that business with, within the city. And so what this ordinance does, it approves a form agreement that anyone that comes in can execute that form agreement and then that would serve as their business license. And so instead of each agreement coming in front of the city council, this would be a, a form agreement that the city administrator can sign on an administrative level, uh, basically stating here's our minimum requirements for operating a scooter, scooter business uh, within Jefferson City. And so uh, that scooter business or that, that form license uh, addresses a few things. It uh, addresses these operational parking standards um and and requires that uh the companies put this information out to their riders but also makes the companies uh responsible for making sure that the uh that these uh, standards are being complied with and actually um uh requires a bond to be uh, placed by the company so that way if for whatever reason the company is not being responsive the city uh can can address you know scooters that are laying out in the middle of the sidewalk or out in the middle of the street and actually charge the uh, against that bond um, the the company for fixing their problem and then there's also some some things about that the city can essentially uh, uh, impound scooters that uh, you know are being addressed and uh, you know making sure that the city is getting compensated for any efforts that we're putting into cleaning up uh, their mess, and so what it day what it does, it creates an incentive um, for the for the companies, whoever that is, to make sure that their uh, program is being done in a way that minimally impacts the uh, the public ways, and particularly the sidewalks. Um, the license agreement also sets forth a licensure fee. Uh, so essentially, because the license agreement is acting as a business license, it also sets the business license fee which is 25 cents per ride that is initiated within the city. Um, appropriate insurance and identifications for the city is included within the, within the agreement. Um, and also a, a kind of a, a maximum fleet size. So we don't want uh, one company kind of flooding the market and, and, and being able to dominate the market in that way by just putting out an unreasonable amount of scooters. This this sets a, a reasonable amount um, and, and then essentially makes them stick to it and then come back to the city council for approval to increase that. And, and there's some provisions there that they're supposed to show that, um, that the increase is justified through ridership. Um, also important um, to, to folks like Sunny, there are some data sharing requirements um, that the city is able to uh, um, uh, look at the data that's being generated kind of on an aggregate level. So that way we know writer sh uh, ridership usage and where these things are being used and how it's impacting our overall transportation system. Um, I think that is probably enough, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Councilman Hensley. Thanks, Ryan. I, I don't think you mentioned this part, but there's also a really broad uh, sole city discretion termination clause, right? Right, there is. And so so in here, it basically says if the city council, for whatever reason, says, you know, this is too much for Jefferson City, this is impacting our, our public, you know, negatively in, in two ways, there is a broad um, kind of escape clause that basically says, we're going to wrap this up and you know, this isn't for us. Any other questions? Councilman Spencer? So have you had any uh, multiple interests with companies coming in in our community to provide this service? Yes. So um, so uh, what kind of originally drove the conversation was that bird scooters, um, from what I can tell, they were making kind of a broad outreach to a bunch of cities uh, within Missouri. And so this was actually shared with bird. Um, and and they are they're you know they they're willing to sign it um, and they want to start operations as soon as possible. Um, if passed by the city council, we will get this out to other scooter companies as well. It's you know um, fair is fair, and you know we're doing a non-exclusive program here. So, thank you. Any other questions, Councilman Lester? From from our last experience. Uh, do we know how much uh, the average uh, monthly usage of scooters was for that last? Uh, 
No, and one of the one of the problems we had with our last experience was the data sharing. We we ended up not getting nearly as much data as as we were um, that we were hoping for. I think we got some complete data for some winter months, which really doesn't tell you a whole lot. So we were we were pretty disappointed with the data that we got in the last program, and and so um, the the provisions that we hear is a little bit more specific as to what we're expecting. And I, and I guess this is a patterned off of. Uh, some other uh, cities uh, ordinances uh, and just wondering uh, how much experience that city had with scooters. Right. Um, so this is in large part pattern off of what they're doing in Columbia. Um, so Columbia, while this agreement um, has been in place since March, I believe it was the part of a longer pilot program that the city and the university ran, uh, I believe, two years before uh, it went in place in March. Um, but the the provisions there, you know, a lot of it were kind of university and, and Columbia specific. Those were stripped out and were left with kind of the more basic requirements. Any other questions? Okay, item 13, bills pending. We've taken up 14, informal calendar 2021-3. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by appropriating additional funds within the parking fund. I know Councilman Fitzwater had indicated that he would like to keep that on the informal. So is there any discussion or questions around the bill that Council has this evening? Okay. Item 15, resolution 2021-4. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing application for a survey project through the Historic Preservation Fund grant. Ms. Senzi. Thank you. Um, the Historic Preservation Fund grant is an opportunity through um, the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we are requesting um, grant funds that would be about $50,000 total project. So it would be 30,000 federal funded $20,000 match um, in order to do a historic context of the city. Uh, what is a historic context? Um, a historic context provides kind of a historiography of your development of your city um, from start to where we are currently. And then it compares, it's a measuring stick for how you developed um, statewide and nationally. And why that is important um, is that it allows for communities to have an inventory of their cultural resources. Um, it will also allow us for um, the city uh, to prioritize projects that we're going to fund future in the future. Um, it also, the big one is it incentivizes adaptive reuse for developers to quickly utilize historic tax credits. Um, so whenever um, you have, especially a lot of industrial buildings, you have a context with how they developed um, compared, compared to national trends. Um, so you can either go in and quickly write a national register nomination, um, or we can eventually do it through grant funding as well. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Item resolution. I'm sorry. Do we have a motion to approve? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Timna. Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Spencer? Aye. Spicer? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Resolution passes. Resolution 2021 5. A resolution of the Council of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, consenting to the transfer of interest in certain documents entered into in connection with the issuance of the city's taxable industrial development revenue bonds continental commercial products project series 2015a for the benefit of zelt creek properties llc approving an assignment and assumption agreement relating to such documents and authorizing certain actions relating thereto mr mullman thank you this resolution would approve an assignment and assumption agreement that relates to the city's chapter 100 uh, industrial redevelopment project um, at no commercial products. So essentially the, uh, the the current owners of the bonds and then therefore the project itself are uh, looking to um, sell the, 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 the property to uh, an, another entity, uh, entity being 
BV Net Lease Capital LLC. And so uh, in the bond documents, it requires that the city consent to this type of transfer. Um, we've been advised by bond council that uh, that uh, city's uh, option to uh, consent to this agreement should not be unreasonably withheld. And so we've kind of reviewed uh, both the operations of the agreement and the, uh, the function of the project under the performance agreement that was originally executed back in 2015 and found no reason to withhold this consent. And so uh, bond council advises and staff recommends that the city council should approve this uh, assumption assignment agreement. So essentially what we're doing, uh, the, the owner of the project is looking to sell the project. And because the city owns the project um, equipment and real estate um, as part of the chapter 100 uh, program that we have to consent to that to that transfer. So we have to answer any questions. That's a really simple way to describe a fairly technical, uh, complicated transaction. Any questions or a motion to approve? So, second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Lester. Aye. Schreiber. Aye. Spencer. Aye. Spicer. Aye. Boat. Aye. Ward. Aye. Wiseman. Aye. Fitzwater. Aye. Hensley. Aye. Kimna. Aye. Resolution passes. Resolution 2021-6. A resolution authorizing the City of Jefferson to adopting the draft Cole County Jefferson City Hazard Mitigation Plan. Thank you. So um, I'm Katrina Williams. I'm with the uh, Planning and Protective Services Department. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the hazard mitigation plan. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, we also have uh, Jennifer Bowden, who is a planner with the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission, um, who is the agency that's contracted with developing this plan. So the, um, the Cole County Jefferson City Hazard Mitigation Plan uh, was adopted last time in 2016, and this is the fourth iteration of this planning process. The Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 amended, amended the uh, Stafford Act, which is the prior Emergency Assistance Act, creating the framework for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments to engage in hazard mitigation planning to receive certain types of non-emergency disaster assistance. When applying for certain types of non-emergency disaster assistance, FEMA requires a hazard mitigation plan to be in place. And so current we, currently we are in compliance. Adoption of this plan would uh, maintain our compliance. The prior plan, um, as I stated before, was completed in 2016. Uh, the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission, of which Jefferson City is a participating member, has contracted with SEMA and the Cole County Commission to update this plan. The goal of the hazard mitigation plan is to help state, tribal, and local governments to increase education and awareness on natural hazards and community vulnerabilities, build partnerships with government organizations, businesses, and the public to reduce risk, identify long-term strategies for risk reduction, identify cost-effective mitigation actions, integrate planning efforts and risk reduction with other community planning efforts, align risk reduction with other state, tribal, or community objectives, communicate priorities to potential funders. Uh, city staff participated with other communities um, in Cole County uh, as stakeholders in the process of updating this. Uh, we attended two meetings in the fall of 2020 uh, to start the process of updating the mitigation actions that are contained within the plan. Uh, staff then held within Jefferson City three additional internal meetings uh, with representation from several different city departments uh, to review actions one by one. That was then forwarded on to the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission for inclusion in the document. Uh, staff also provided the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission with asset inventory data to produce the vulnerability analysis that's a requirement in the plan. The MOA signed by Cole County, uh, the Cole County Commission, SEMA, and the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission stipulates that participating jurisdictions must adopt the draft plan before SEMA or FEMA will review the document. So this is a little bit different than how we would normally operate with adopting a planning document. Um, so we're doing it early. There is a comment process that's still open um, through June 11th. Uh, comments on the draft plan can be accepted through June 11th uh, via the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission and staff is recommending adoption of the plan um, to maintain our eligibility. And I'm happy to answer any questions. If I can't answer your questions, um, Ms. Bowden can also do that. Okay, thank you, Katrina. Do we have any questions? 
I'm sorry. I did want to add that I, um, you should have had this delivered to you at each of your seats. So I hope you've had a chance to look at those. So those are our actions that we've reviewed. So any, do we have a motion to approve? To move to approve. Second. Any further questions for Ms. Williams or uh, Ms. Bowden? Or council deliberation? All right, roll call please. Schreiber? Aye. Spencer? Aye. Spicer? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Tinsley? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Resolution passes, and thank you both uh, for being here this evening. Thanks. Item 16, presentations from the gallery on other topics. We don't have anyone signed up this evening, but is there anyone here that's here to talk about that or anyone online? Okay. Item 17, any council and staff discussion of presentation topics? 18, any new business? 19, I need a motion to approve, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman Spicer and Spencer, or Spencer first and then Spicer. I just have a question for Chief Schofield. How are we as far as staffing within the fire department currently? We, um, we have two positions uh, open at this time. We have uh, one from retirement and one from uh, employment. So, so we, we, are, we are too short, but we're working hard to get those positions filled. Thank you. Councilman Spicer. I think the uh, chief is here tonight. Got a question for Jared. Uh, how are we on staffing over the police department? Uh, the police department's currently got five vacancies in our commission staff. So, I guess we had an incident t t today, I guess. Probably going to lose one for a little while. So, you'll have six vacancies, I mean, six spots for a while. Correct. Well, we've got we've got five vacancies, and then yes, we will have. Uh, You'll be down six. We'll be down. We'll be down an additional position for a undetermined period of time while that investigation takes place. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Item nineteen. I need a motion to approve the May seventeenth closed session minutes. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Spencer. Aye. Spicer. Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Motion passes. Item 20, any unfinished business? Item 21, a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. All in favor say aye, and we are adjourned. Thank aye. you. Oh, I 